When Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took to the podium at the UN General Assembly last month, something incredible happened. The majority of countries from around the world immediately stood up and walked out in a silent protest against the Israeli leader. You've probably never seen that clip before, but it speaks volumes to the reality of the situation. Israel is now almost completely ostracized by the international community as Netanyahu clings to a fundamentalist ideology that has turned Israel into the most violent nation in the world. Nearly 42,000 Palestinians have been murdered in the past 365 days. That's one out of 55 people in Gaza, with 69% of the victims being women and children. Israel's reported objectives of eliminating Hamas and freeing the hostages are no closer to being achieved, and new reports indicate that Israel's economy is paying a high price for its widening war. Israel rejects the two-state solution because it claims that a sovereign state of Palestine would profoundly endanger Israel's national security. But what if I told you the lack of a two-state solution is actually the biggest threat to the future of Israel? Israel's illegal occupation of Palestinian lands, its continuing apartheid rule over millions of Palestinians, and its extreme violence to defend that rule all put Israel's survival in jeopardy. Israel consistently preaches to the world that Palestinians and the Arab world cannot live alongside it and only wish to destroy it. But this statement is completely false, and you simply just need to listen to the words of Jordan's Prime Minister, who addressed the United Nations to combat this false narrative. The Israeli Prime Minister came here today and said that Israel is surrounded by those who want to destroy it, an enemy. We're here, members of a Muslim Arab committee, mandated by 57 Arab and Muslim countries, and I can tell you here, very unequivocally, all of us are willing to, right now, uh, guarantee the security of Israel in the context of Israel ending the occupation and uh, 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 allowing for the emergence of a Palestinian state. He is creating that danger because he simply does not want the two-state solution. And if he does not want the two-state solution, can you ask the Israeli officials, what is their end game? What a powerful testimony, but more importantly, what a powerful question that absolutely needs to be answered. What is Israel's end game here? In the past 365 days, Israel has dropped 75,000 tons of explosives on Gaza, the equivalent of five nuclear bombs like the one the US dropped on Hiroshima. Approximately 87% of Gaza's schools have been damaged or destroyed, with 11,500 students killed by Israeli forces. Gaza's entire medical industry has collapsed with 34 hospitals completely out of operation. And this total collapse of infrastructure has led to widespread disease and left 95% of the population without access to clean water. It's hard to claim that Palestine poses an existential threat to Israel's existence, or that this is even considered a war, when Israel has the ability to unleash such overwhelming and unrestricted destruction. This imbalance of power is made even more extreme by the fact that Israel enjoys the full backing of the world's most powerful military in the United States. Once again, Jordan's prime minister asked the question that no Israeli official can answer. Can you ask Israelis what's their narrative other than I'm gonna continue to go to war, I'm gonna kill this and kill that and destroy this and this that. The, the amount of damage that Israeli government has done, 30 years of efforts, to convince people that peace is possible, this Israeli government killed it. The amount of dehumanization, hatred, bitterness will take generations to navigate, to, to navigate through. So ultimately the question is, we want peace and we've laid out a plan for peace. Ask any Israeli official, what is their plan for peace? You'll get nothing because they're only thinking of the first step, we're gonna go, go destroy Gaza, inflame the West Bank, destroy Lebanon, and after that, they have no plan. Minister Safadi's words carry a lot of weight, as he was not only speaking on behalf of Jordan, but also on behalf of the 57 members of the Muslim Arab Committee, who are all willing to guarantee Israel's security in the context of a two-state solution. Just listen to the joint statement the committee released earlier this year. We call on the international community to assume its responsibilities, to follow up efforts to advance the peace process, to achieve a just and comprehensive peace based on the two-state solution, which embodies an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital on the lines of the 4th of June, 1967, able to live in security and peace alongside Israel in accordance with the resolutions of the international legitimacy and established references, including the Arab Peace Initiative. The terms for peace are quite clear and reasonable. 
Palestinians just want a chance to govern themselves and live in dignity like any other country. They seek to uphold the unanimously agreed upon 1967 borders as recognized by international consensus. It's as simple as that. But Israel actually takes it one step further. Not only has the country consistently rejected the one-state solution that would bring peace to the region, it is now expanding its territory. Ministers in the far-right government have openly stated their intent to remove Palestinians from Gaza and build settlements in the Strip. Some Israeli politicians have even called for the expansion of existing borders to what they consider Greater Israel. This is the belief that Israel's true borders are the ones that are referenced in the Bible. If Israel is able to achieve this goal, it would occupy parts of modern-day Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Palestine. Independent top UN officials appointed to investigate the conflict have concluded the idea of a greater Israel is fueling Netanyahu's ideology. This is a major revelation, as even the United Nations isn't afraid to admit the true intentions of Netanyahu and his cabinet. Just take it from the words of Israeli's finance minister, who in this article, from Middle East and I, calls for Israel's borders to extend to Damascus, Syria. Israeli soldiers have also been wearing patches depicting the image of Greater Israel on their uniforms during Gaza operations. These extreme views are now the mainstream political goals of the Israeli government. Since October 7th, rather than a genuine effort to retrieve the hostages and work towards a lasting peace, we've witnessed an escalation aimed at provoking further conflicts with Lebanon, Syria, and Iran, while potentially seizing more territory for settlements. This is certainly the case in the West Bank, as Israeli extremist settlers are seizing records amounts of land, often violently. While the situation is undeniably dire, it's evident that Israel has overplayed its hand. They're no closer to achieving any of their objectives in Gaza, and now are facing a tactical situation that's very similar to the American war in Vietnam. Troops are constantly returning to areas in the Gaza Strip they had supposedly cleared, only to face the same resistance again. And here's something even more striking. Hamas has reportedly gained 3,000 fighters and continues to operate in northern Gaza. It seems that when Israel kills more innocent children, it fuels the resistance, prompting more people to rise up and join the fight. But once again, there's a bigger problem for Israel. The vast majority of the world now votes in favor of Palestine to be admitted into the United Nations. While on the flip side, Israel continues to lose diplomatic relations around the world. One of the most critical losses for Israel was its relationship with Saudi Arabia. While the two countries have never formally established relations, both the Saudis and the Jewish state were working closer on a deal to build a larger regional partnership. However, the Saudi foreign minister made it clear in this October 2nd op-ed for the Financial Times that the two-state solution is the only viable path to peace and normalization. But of course, we can't have this conversation without addressing the U.S. government and its role in this conflict. The reality is, without a continuous supply of U.S. arms, Israel wouldn't be able to sustain its war effort. Diplomatically, the U.S. has the power and ability to stop this conflict almost immediately. As reported by a senior Israeli Air Force official, Israel wouldn't be able to wage war for more than a few months without U.S. weapons. But of course, there's another problem. American politicians are completely captured by the Israeli lobby, which runs so much political campaigns throughout U.S. politics. But all of this comes at a very large cost. It's damaging to the Middle East, and it's hurting American citizens too. Israel's violent, extremist agenda does nothing to protect U.S. security nor serve American interests. But most importantly, it also does not help Israel in the long term either. Israel is now completely ostracized by the international community, and its economy is in disarray. Israel's credit rating is already plummeting, and Israel is likely to lose its investment-grade credit rating very soon, with dire long-term economic consequences. In the end, Israel faces a critical crossroad. On one path, accepting the two-state solution would not only give Palestinians the sovereignty and dignity they deserve, but also secure a lasting peace that benefits both nations. The step would allow for the reconstruction of trust and pave the way for regional stability. The alternative is a dangerous path of continued occupation and escalating violence, which will only deepen the cycle of hatred and resistance, ensuring that this conflict never ends. With mounting international pressure, Israel's hand is being forced either to embrace the two-state solution or face isolation and more dangerous threats from its neighbors in the region. But now I want to switch gears and show you an interesting graph that will demonstrate exactly what the future of this and many conflicts around the world will involve. This is the Cybercrime Index, which ranks countries by cybercrime threat level. No surprise here that Russia and Ukraine take the top two spots, but even even the United States, Iran, 
and Israel all rank inside the top 20 as global cybersecurity threats. I bring this up because geopolitics moves markets and creates opportunities. And now I'm going to switch to the investing portion of today's video and tell you about today's video sponsor, Pluralox Security Incorporated, which trades under the symbol PLC. KF. Now to give you some context into what the future of warfare will look like, let's start with this December 2023 Forbes article entitled Cybersecurity, the Fifth Battlefield. It opens with a truly amazing quote. Over the past 50 years, battlefields have been marked by air, land, and sea. Today, however, the traditional battlefield is expanding with space and cybersecurity emerging as battlegrounds four and five respectively. We actually saw this come into full effect in the Russia-Ukraine war in January 2022, when Ukraine was hit hard by Whispergate, a malware aimed at dismantling critical infrastructure throughout the country. But the biggest takeaway from this event is that it highlights a critical shift in the evolution of warfare. When a true ground war began, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure were the first strike. Cybersecurity Ventures, the world's leading researcher and publisher covering the global cyber economy, predicts the price tag of cybercrime damage will reach $10.5 trillion by 2025, a staggering amount that if measured as a country would be the third largest after the US and China. Moving forward, we are also facing an unprecedented number of global conflicts. The Russia-Ukraine war will burden Europe for the foreseeable future. Israel is fighting no less than seven different conflicts with its neighbors in the Middle East, and US and China tensions continue to escalate. Honestly speaking, there is just so much going on in the world right now, and it's why I think a company like Pluralock is positioned well to benefit from this chaos. So let's break down exactly what they do and why there is so much potential with this company. We'll start with the financial as Pluralock has seen an impressive revenue growth, which nearly doubled over 24 months, from $36.6 million in 2021 to $70.4 million in 2023. In 2024, they've signed over $40 million in new contracts, and that includes the largest single sale in company history, a $19.3 million contract with a key S&P 500 listed player in the global semiconductor supply chain. If we take a look at their most recent earnings, Q2 2024 shows the company is continuing to execute its goals and saw a 98% year-on-year growth of critical services, pulling in a gross profit of $2 million, which is up over 42% year over year. The business has three sources of revenue, the first being the Critical Services Division, which provides managed enterprise cybersecurity services that are tailored to the customer's needs. This division is leading margin expansion with a 144% increase in gross margin. It's also growing at breakneck speed. Just last week, Pluralock announced a partnership between their Critical Services Division and CrowdStrike to secure critical infrastructure in democratic nations and economies. The collaboration empowers Pluralock to deploy CrowdStrike's Falcon platform to institutions and organizations looking to modernize their security operations for today's growing threat environment. The second is the Solutions Division, which provides a full line of leading IT and cybersecurity solutions. And the final piece of the business, operating between 60 to 80% gross margins, is their proprietary SaaS software that provides all-in-one cloud identity protection. Now, arguably the most important part of a growing company is the management and team who is driving the business. And Pluralock has assembled some of the best industry experts to lead this company. We'll start with Ian Peterson, the CEO of Pluralock, who is a 15-year analytics entrepreneur whose specialty is closing multi-million dollar deals. He is joined by a group of talented world-class directors and advisors, including retired Navy Admiral Mike McConnell, who served as the Director of National Intelligence under both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, Patrick Gorman, the former CIO for the U.S. intelligence community, Joe Sexton, the former Director of CrowdStrike, and Ed Hammersley, former President of Raytheon Cyber Products. Finally, we'll discuss the client list of Pluralock, which is extremely impressive as the company has locked in contracts with some of the most high profile clients you can imagine. That includes more than 30 federal agencies such as NASA, the US Navy and Air Force, in addition to an enterprise list of global 2000 companies including major hospitals, key airports, and global semiconductor companies. Many of my long-term viewers will know my thoughts on microchips and that they are the most valuable piece of technology for the future of our world. But like we mentioned throughout today's video, conflicts are not going to stop anytime soon. And unfortunately, the way the world is going, they are only likely to increase in the future. If you're an investor who likes cybersecurity, I think there's a lot of potential with Pluralock. But as always, I want to remind you to do your own homework and research before investing in any companies. And to help you with that, I'm going to link the stock ticker, 
investor presentation, and company website down in the description for you below. Thank you all for spending time with me here today on YouTube, and I look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.